Ah, good morning, everybody. It's Carl here, Carl Lehman on the Coffee with Carl ser series, and I'm delighted to welcome Steve Judge with us today. Say hello, Steve. Hi, hi, everybody. Uh, nice to be here, and thank you, Carl, for the opportunity here so that we can have a chat, but also I get to share my story, my inspiration, but I'm really looking forward to, to the questions that you've got, and let's see what you can get out of me so that I can just share as much as possible. No pressure, no pressure. Well, just by a bit of a background here for anybody who's just tuning into this, um, I, I was introduced to uh, Steve by a trusted sort of contact of mine, and he said that uh, um, you had a really phenomenal story. And the, the background to this is back in 2002, um, you had a horrific car accident and I'll let you talk about that more in a minute but you were told that you, you, you might never walk again and, and and then you've actually sort of gone and blown that one out out, out the park but you've then gone on in 2011 and 2012 to become a world champion in your sport of para triathlon which is just amazing and to add to the list of you know accomplishments that you've done as well in 2019 publish the book don't lean on your excuses you know, that kind of is a little bit of a tease, I hope, for people to kind of tune into this. So, Steve, you know, tell us a, a little bit about your journey, how it started, and let, let, let's get into the nuts and bolts of the conversation, shall we? Oh, OK, where it started. I, don't, I never know, really know how far back to go, but I think me as, a, me as a kid, you know, I used to, I was very active, had a great family. We loved running all together. I loved activities like scouting, very much into scouting with the badges. I, I love the badges that you get down the arm. Uh, and I, I would always, I used to be that scout that used to take the badge book home and I'd look through it and I'd see which badge I wanted next. And then I'd make that kind of my goal and I'd ask for help, of course, for my mum, my dad, the scout leader. But I think, you know, they would help me to achieve it. And I, th I didn't realise then, but I guess in a way I was setting a, a foundation for myself, setting goals and working towards them, finding out what I really wanted. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, again, with scout badges, Sometimes you work out what you're good at and sometimes you work out what you're not so good at, but you've experienced it. And I think that that rings true with, with life, you know, it gets a bit deep there. We're just talking about scouting, but going from scouting in my, I, I left school. First job I had was working down the coal pit as a maintenance fit and mechanical engineer. And I, I love that job because as an engineer, you have to be, you have to be ingenious. You know, you, you're given a problem, you have to find a solution. Being down the coal pit, trying to get this machine up and running again being you know robbing parts from other broken down machines to get my machine up and running that's what i really enjoyed you know the you know down there the coal face you can't lean on excuses you've got to find a solution and as soon right. as it was done I was, I was out of there i didn't like the condition so much but the job itself was was brilliant so did that i worked in the laboratory i went traveling around the world because the, the coal was closed at some point worked my way around uh, you know so i worked in all the countries as a workman just for nine months um, but yeah, I had a really good life, everything good, every fit and healthy, very average, I would say, uh, which takes us up to about 2002. And that's when I had the, the car accident. And, and that was just a freak accident. I was literally just driving, well, on the outskirts of Sheffield, where I live, um, mm -hmm. it was a rainy day and there's a bit of water on the road. And as I came around this, this bend in the road, the car just skidded. It, it just lost control. Um, I, I can remember I couldn't do anything left or right and the brakes weren't working and it's just all I could do was grip onto the steering wheel and just just hold on and I could see out of the window that I was heading towards skidding towards a big metal pole right. and it's just a case of bracing myself and having that that thought of I knew what was going to happen and just like waiting for impact and it you know I can't remember the actual impact but I remember just coming to maybe a couple of minutes later the, the sound of the horn beeping, uh, doing my head in. And I, the first thing I wanted to do was get out of the car, brush myself off and pretend that that hadn't happened, just walk away from it, yeah. but I couldn't. The, the car was bent in half, my, my, both my legs were crushed. Um, I didn't know how badly, but I, you know, when I reached down with my hands, I, I couldn't feel all the way down, which is a good thing, because if I'd felt any further down, I probably would have gone into shock and that could have been you know, disastrous. Sure. But basically, I was stuck there. Everybody came to save me, police, ambulance, fire brigade, paramedics. And it took them about an hour and a half to cut the car apart, reach in, drag me and my legs out. And then, and to be honest, let me just tell you how I felt at that point. Because when I was stuck in the car, I, was, I couldn't get out. As soon as somebody arrived, and it was the paramedic, as soon as she arrived and poked her head through the window, I felt better. Straight yeah. away, I felt calm because I knew that somebody was there to help me. We'd done a lot about 
the NHS, you know, through the COVID-19 and everything like that. They're amazing. But it's when somebody comes to your aid, somebody that can help you, whether that's a paramedic, whether that's a coach, whether that's a friend or family member, it can make such a big difference. And I, I felt so much better. Also, they gave me some, some drugs, which probably helped me. Uh, so that probably <laughs> relaxed me as well. But basically, they, then the police and the ambulance and everybody else, and they all came to save me, to, to take the car apart. They got me into the ambulance. As soon as in the ambulance, I felt even more better or, or better because I was now moving. I was actually moving towards um, safety. I was away from the wreckage and I was moving towards the hospital. And in the ambulance, and we were talking about this before we started, the ambulance, the other two members were called Steve and Steve. So you can imagine all of us saying, all right, Steve, yes, Steve, I'm good, Steve. Where are we going, Steve? We're going to go to the hospital, Steve. Okay, Steve, yes, good, Steve. We're going to go very fast, Steve. Okay, Steve, yes, Steve. And very safely, Steve. Is that okay, Steve? Yes, good, Steve. So, you know, there's a massive, strange conversation going on. And I was still on the drugs. So I was thinking, wow, am I imagining this? This is surreal. There's a but comedy sketch there. right there. <laughs> there is, isn't there? Uh, so when we got to the hospital, you know, again, I felt safe. I was full. Now I had a whole team around me trying to save my life, save my legs. And they, they got me ready. They took me into the operating theatre. Uh, they, they dealt with me. Uh, eight hours I was in there for. It's a long operation. Wow. I came out and I was just, you know, when I woke up, when I came to, I think that's when the that's when the reality hits, you know, before then you just are very optimistic, very positive. Everything's going to be okay. I'm in safe hands. Here we go. When I woke up, I suddenly realized how bad I felt, how uncomfortable I felt, how stiff and, and everything I felt. Um, and it was around that time when the surgeon was doing the rounds and said, the operation is done. It kind of like this, this is it. So the operation is done. Good news is we've managed to save your legs. Right. And, and the bad news is, because of the severity of the injuries, you may never walk again. And that's when it hits you. You know, all this positivity and optimism is kind of just blown away. And you think, say what? I, but no, I'm here at hospital. This is what you do. You save people. You save their legs. You, you do amazing stuff. And they're like, we've done an amazing thing, Steve. But, we, you know, we don't know how it's going to go from here. But hearing those words is very much, for me, it's like a fight or flight at that moment. And the, the flight being, I could have just given in and rolled over in bed and said, okay, I guess I'll never walk again. And I'll, I'll trust you. But the, the opposite of that, and I felt a lot of anger, just a, just a massive pulse of anger, thinking, you know, who are you to say that to me? You don't even know who I am. You've just given me two legs. Right. And now you're saying that I might not be able to use them. I might not be able to stand and walk again. What, what the hell? You know, this is, as a human being, this is one of the things that we take for granted, a normality is to walk, stand and walk. And um, yeah, I just felt, I guess that's the fight. The, the fight in me was just like, uh, like a red rag to a bull, I'll prove you wrong. Mm. Anybody who tells me, I don't, other people might be the same, but when somebody tells you you can't do something, well, for me, that gets me really angry. <laughs> really like, I'll, I'll show you, I'll prove you wrong. And, and sometimes they're right, but a lot of the time they could be wrong. Um, and that's where the optimism, call it, a, I say optimism a lot, but blend with that a little bit of ignorance as well. Ignorance can be really good sometimes. It can keep you going. If you haven't got all the facts, it's like put your fingers in your ears and go la, 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 la. He was speaking from a surgeon's point of view. He was speaking from the average human. He was speaking from his you know, experience and guidance and everything like that. But he didn't know me. And I'm not saying I'm a Superman, but I'm just saying he hadn't come across me before. And I think that's, that's what was different. And so I was ready to, to do anything and everything. And the first thing I had to do was get energy. I was so exhausted. I just needed to eat food. And I knew that that's what I needed to survive. Uh, and, then, and then the journey goes from there, you know, uh, thinking about what I could do to, to get myself better. All the physio and the hard work that I had to do. Because, you know, let me explain my injuries because the listeners out there, they, they don't yeah, exactly know do. my this left leg. Important. My left leg had been ripped apart at the knee. So the four ligaments that hold my knee together, uh, they've been ripped out. Uh, my right leg had been partially amputated. What that means is that four inches of bone from the middle of my, my shin bone had been knocked out, my tibia bone, knocked out and put in the bin. So my, my leg was four inches short. It was held together with a big metal cage. So as, as my legs lay together, you know, one was four inches longer than the other one. That, that's massive. And I was like, well, you know, what am I supposed to do with that? And they're going, you, you need to grow it back. You, what Steve, have got to 
just yeah, to, yeah. To there. When, when when I spoke to you previously and you told me about this like four inches you know and I thought oh, well, you know what what is that and I'll tell you what it didn't really hit me until I saw a photograph of you lying mm. on the bed and um you know you've obviously you you, you know you, you're lying there with the one leg and then the other leg is significantly shorter I mean four inches you kind of think oh well that, that, that's not much but when you look at it on a leg you think holy cow that is that, that's more yeah. life-changing that's like you know absolutely horrendous but please continue you know how, how you you know your, your journey went from then because that is just absolutely staggering what happened next having to twist the bolts on this cage day after day so it was my responsibility but before I, before I say my responsibility it's all about the goal. So wh why was I twisting bolts? Why was I inflicting pain on myself? Because I wanted to stand again and walk again. I'm always talking to people about what's your goal, what's pushing you, what's your self actualization At that moment in time, after the survival thing had been come to get my leg back to the right length, what do I need to do that? You need to twist the bolts. You need to inflict pain on yourself every single day, four times a day. Is that okay, Steve? You're like, well, I don't know if it's okay, but that's, if that's what I've got to do, then that's what I've got to do. So that's what I did. And when I got the, the, the bone to, you know, the leg to the right leg, I was like, yay, I've done it. Great, can we get this big metal cage off my leg? And I said, no, Mr. Judge, now you've got to grow the bone. I'm like, say what? And I said, you've got no bone there. You've just got a gap in your leg. Now you've got to grow the bone back. Okay, how long is that going to take? Well, Mr. Judge, it depends. To cut a long story short, it took a year and a half to grow it back. Oh, now, I'm, I'm impatient at the best of times, but you know, that was just a nightmare. And again, it's like, well, how do I grow this bone back? And they said, well, I said, is it easy? Do you just drink milk, eat cheese, just calcium and stuff? And they went, no, 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 Mr. Judge. You're going to stand on it. You're going to walk on it. I said, oh, sorry, but there's no bone in my leg. But, you know, and they said, yeah, but you've got to trust the cage that's holding it all together. So to actually lift myself up on the Zimmer frame, to actually put weight through my leg, which has got no bone in it, so it's got a gap, and put my trust in this big metal cage holding it all together, and the pain that I went through, the, the mindset that I went through, was astronomical but that's what I needed to do to achieve my goal and this is why it's so important to know what your goal is if, if I didn't know what my goal was I'd be going well I'm not doing this I'm not doing this for fun but I'm doing this because it's something that I believed in and I was passionate about optimistic yes a little bit of ignorance absolutely because four inches is a lot two inches usually is recommended it wouldn't go any further than two inches but four inches they didn't have a choice because that's how much bone they had to throw away uh, so to stand on it, to eventually start walking on my leg uh, was, was just mind-numbingly painful uh, and very emotional for me as well. And to do that day in, day out for a year and a half, yeah, there's highs and lows. And, you know, we probably haven't got time to go through the, all the highs and lows now, but there were definitely highs and there were definitely lows. And I think, you know, along that, that journey, I hit rock bottom uh, with the question, why? why? Why is it happening to me? Why am I going through all of this? It is hard, it's challenging, um, but you know, that's what I had to do. And I had to think about, there was at one point when I was doing all this physio, whether it was the standing, the walking, the stretching, my left leg, my right leg, all of this stuff. At one point I was doing 22 different exercises and I was still going to the physio one day a week uh, and saying, what more can I do? What more can I do? What more can I do? This is my leg, these are my legs, this is my body. I want to have no regrets. And when I get to the end of this rehabilitation phase, or however long it's going to last, I, I know I'm, I'm not going to be like as, as I was, but I want to have no regrets. I don't want to say, I wish I'd done more physio. I wish I'd done more exercises. I wish I'd listened to, to more you know, professionals. I want to consider every single thing. So I was asking them what more I could do. And it was, it was hard because, you know, sat at home with nobody pushing me to do my physio apart from me is, is difficult to do. But again, I had a goal. Where, where, where did you get that inspiration from? Where was that drive coming from? I mean, talk me through, you know, the, the thoughts you were having after the, the accident and, you know, obviously the realisation that you, you've had this accident. It, it, it's it's life-changing. You know, thank goodness it didn't take your life. I mean, it could very easily have done that. But talk me through the thoughts you were having in the initial weeks and then how you got to that point where you, you're so focused and driven. I mean, where... Talk, talk us through that. So in a, in a contradiction, I think I can be a little bit rebellious sometimes, as in if, if somebody tells me to do something, I'm like, why? You know, don't, don't, don't go over the fence. And I'll be looking up and down and go, why? Why can't I go over the fence? You know, there's, no, there's nothing on the sign that says why I can't do it. So I'd, you know, use my common sense and risk assessment, et cetera. Yeah. Um, 
but I'm also very compliant with, with rules. If somebody says, you, you know, you're not allowed to do this, these are the rules, this is the law, I'm like, okay, fair enough, and especially if I understand why. So the physios and the surgeons, they were telling me what to do to get better. And I was like, okay, I get it, I'll do that then. It reminds me of Forrest Gump. Uh, have you ever seen the film? He was told oh, what to do. Right. Yeah. yeah, you know, you know, he was told to run, so he ran. When he went to the army, they told him how to strip down a, a rifle and put it back together. So that's what he did. He just did it. Yeah. And I, in a way, that's what I'm like. They told me to do this physio, twist the bolts every day, your leg will get to the right length. Right. All right, okay, I'll do that then. So <laughs> that's what I did. But more than that, I think, you know, obviously I've got the goal, I was told what to do. But then for myself, um, I benchmark. So I think benchmarking is something that I've always done, um, whether as, a, as an engineer, but also I did a lot of sports. I was always writing down my, my times uh, and how I felt and stuff and little comments. And I've always done that. Uh, and you can even go back to the, the scouting badges. You know, how many badges have I got now? Okay, I want a few more. How many badges have I got now? I want the next award up. So for benchmarking, for me, they told me to do something. First thing I did as an engineer was benchmark it. I couldn't get my, my right leg straight. Uh, they said, Steve, you need your leg straight, else you're going to walk with a limp for the rest of your life. Right. Okay, that, that makes sense. Okay, I'll get my leg straight, sorted. First thing I did, bought a protractor so I could measure my leg, so I could measure the angle, so I could benchmark it. Then I could start doing physio, then I could see the progress, how I was getting better and better and better. Um, and do you know what they used to, when they used to go for the sessions, they say, Mr. Judge, how are you getting on with your leg? I was like, I'll show you a graph, look at this. It's like, <laughs> like in the Excel spreadsheet of, of my progress getting better and better. But it wasn't for them that I was doing it. It was for me, I needed to see that. I needed to give myself some positivity, some motivation to tell myself, look how well you're doing, Steve. Keep going every single day, three times a day, whatever it takes, because you are getting better and you need to see that. And when you get to the result, you know, the celebration, you've got to see all the hard work you put into it. So benchmarking is the first thing you've got to do if you ever want to achieve anything in your life, whether it's losing weight, you want to lose weight, you know, weigh yourself and benchmark it. You want to earn money, what's your bank account now? Think about what you've got now. You want more clients? How many clients you've got now? And benchmark it. And that's what I was doing. Where I got that from, probably just from my past, my upbringing, but that helped me loads. And that's what I'm still using now. Uh, it's all about the plan, isn't it? All progress begins by telling the truth. Uh, it's something I, I say to our clients when we work with them. And I said, you know, it's one of those things, you know, to get where you need to be, you first need to know where you're starting from. Mm. And, uh, yes. I was interviewing somebody last week, Mark Village, actually, on uh, another Coffee with Carl uh, video. We were talking about how, how do you eat an elephant? You know, it's, it's just huge. The, the goal is too big. And, and Mark said, one bite at a time. That's yeah. how you relevant one bite at a time. So it's interesting how you've had that sort of that kind of goal out there to to be able to walk and and, and, and do all the things that you did before, but actually you've broken it down into little bite sized chunks and you've given yourself almost like rewards along the way. Yeah. Um, and as somebody who's married to a clinical psychologist uh, by background, you know, I kind of see how the kind of mind works in all of that. that that, that, that's kind of brilliant. So how on earth, and th this is the thing when I was reading your book, you know, so obviously you were, you were a fanatical runner before yeah. your accident. So you did 10 K runs, you did marathon distances, etc. So running was a real passion for you. What, what really um, hit me when I was reading the book was, was it something like seven and a half years yeah. it was before you ran? Now I can't imagine for somebody who in the book I'm reading it and I think this guy obviously loved his running, it was a real passion of his life and then for the next seven and a half years couldn't do it and actually never knew if you would be able to do it again. So how on earth do you get from you know, your rehabilitation to actually then being able to run? How on earth so, do you make that? I mean, that's that's a commitment, isn't it? Seven and a half years to get to <laughs> that goal. That's not giving up. That's perseverance gone 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 mad on steroids, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But I think that again, I might contradict what I say at other times. Um, I've given, I packed running away. I realised looking at my trash legs in hospital. I guess I'll never run again. When they said, you know, you will never walk and stand again, I thought, well, I can do that. But even I was thinking. What about running? And I think I just crushed it down. I put it in a box and I buried it deep, deep down. As my rehabilitation came through and after a year and a half in the cage was released, I was like, I could stand and walk again. In the back of my mind, I said, and the running? How are we doing with the running, Steve? And I was like, not going to happen, is it, Steve? Right. I, I couldn't move my... my so, yeah, let, let me express what my legs are like after the rehabilitation. They're obviously the right length, um, which is good. Can I just express? Uh, they are the right length. 
because I, when I was stretching the, the bone out and everything, people, I said, well, when do I stop twisting these bolts? I don't want to go too far. I don't want to get my <laughs> too long. That would be crazy. And they said, well, just stop when you think it's right. I think, well, when I think it's right, what do you mean when I think it's right? I'm an engineer. I need something like measured with a laser. Um, so I remember being sat at home in my wheelchair and I, my feet would be flat on the floor. Uh, and what I did in the end was I got a spirit level and I put it on my knees. And so when the bubble was in the middle, then the, the length of my legs were the same. No so that's it. So yeah, I had to use you know what I had in, in my engineering capabilities to make sure that my legs were the right length. And that's when I stopped. Uh, so no rules or anything, just a spirit level. So my legs were the right length. I, my bone was growing back. My, my left leg, um, the four ligaments that were ripped out, they got replaced with ligaments from a pig. So I don't want to ask too many questions, but I've got pig ligaments in my knee holding it all together. I've got lack of feeling. I've got a drop foot, lack of sensitivity. My right leg um, looks pretty ghastly. It's got no calf muscle and I can't move my right foot. I can then move it by about 10 degrees. I get a lot of pain in that. Um, basically how I show it when I'm talking on the stage is I've got no suspension. I have on my left foot, if I jump up and down on my left foot a little bit, my right foot, there's nothing there. I can't hop on my right foot. So you blend that into trying to, to walk. It's kind of a roll on, roll off. And that causes me pain in my ankle. You try that with running. It's just not going to happen. It's every time it's like a, a solid bang. That there's no suspension there. So I realized that I couldn't run. So you asked me, how did I end up running? So <laughs> um, for seven and a half years, I filled my life with other stuff. Yeah. I, also, I had to start thinking about what I could do rather than what I couldn't do. This is very much about getting back to my normality. There's no such thing as normal. I was very different to what I was before the accident. It's a big message that I pass out there for people to, to stop comparing themselves to other people, their friends, their families, celebrities, etc. I was very different to what I was before the accident. So what could I do now? I could swim, so I swam. I could cycle, so I cycled. Eventually, this is. And when I say swim, not with my legs, with my arms. You know, I, yeah. my legs were just being dragged along. Cycling, yeah, it was okay until I hit a hill. Then it was really difficult. Mm -hmm. But again, thinking what I could do. Could I walk? Huh, I could sort of, but it caused a lot of pain. I didn't really like it, but I could walk a little bit and put up with the pain. Could I run? No. Um, and then uh, I was doing lots of challenges, lots of charity stuff. And somebody said, Steve, wow, you're always pushing yourself. You're always setting goals and working towards them. Have you always been like this? And so I, I said, no, I don't think so. Um, not with school and not with work. But then I thought about the scouting, which I mentioned earlier. And I said, well, I, do you know what? In scouting, I used to love those badges. And that compelled me to go and find this photo uh, of me when I was 10 and a half years old. And uh, it's got me holding the Cup of the Year award, very proud. I've got three badges on my arm. And the first three badges that I ever got in scouting were swimming, cycling, and running. And oh, just man. looking at this photo, it just compelled me to think, wow, mm. I don't believe in coincidences, but wow, um, I want to find a new challenge. And I, I, I went on the internet, I was looking for a new challenge of swimming and cycling, and the only thing I could find is a thing called triathlon. I was like, damn, I can't run, but maybe I could do the swim, the bike, and the run section. I could just walk around. The thing is, would be to finish. That would be my goal, to finish. I still call myself a triathlete, I think. Um, but then I scrolled down, and then I found this thing called a, a power triathlon. I thought, oh, what's that? It's a triathlon for disabled people. And I'm like, well, I wonder if I'm classed as disabled. Uh, I don't know. So I, I looked into it, and I went for an assessment, and they did lots of tests on me to see if I was disabled. And after the assessments and the questions and, and all sorts, they said, Mr. Judge, you are disabled. And I'm like, great, this is fantastic. I'm disabled. So, because now I could register as a disabled athlete. Now I could be competitive because I've missed a bit of the story. Out when I was doing my charity stuff, none of this was competitive. I needed that thing of competitiveness. And I'm not super competitive. I am a nice guy, but I've also got that streak of competitiveness inside me of striving towards something. And that's what I need. I needed to enter a race, not an event, a race. And so this, this power triathlon was going to be it. And they said, Steve, uh, can you run? And I said, not yet. But now I had a goal. I'm always talking about the goal. I now was going to enter this power triathlon with swimming, cycling, and running. My swimming and cycling were pretty good. Well, I could be you know, doing really well. It would be a shame to let it all go on the run section. So I remember thinking, I'm going to go and try and run. And I had some trainers, and the trainers make a massive difference to me just because of the flexibility in them. 
And I was on holiday uh, in Fred Ventura, and I remember going and running for the first time. And it was just surreal. It makes me feel quite emotional when I think about it, because I, uh, to get this thing back that I loved after seven and a half years, to, to start running a lot, I remember using my upper body so much and sweat pouring down my, my, uh, my face with the amount of effort that I was putting in. I, I remember putting sweat bands on my wrists to wipe away the sweat because of the effort I was putting in. I, don't get me wrong, I was fit and healthy at this stage, doing a lot of swimming and cycling, but it's the running, it's the effort. And the, my legs were, were, were running, I, so my brain knew what to do, and my legs were kind of struggling to do it. But the memory was there of what I needed to do, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, keep moving the arms and the legs will follow. And I remember looking down at my legs and just going, oh my gosh, I'm running again. And just seeing that, it's just incredible. And, you know, almost welling up, but also mixed in with the sweat. So I wasn't too sure if it was. And then I went off road and went into the, the, the desert where we were. And then I get, got really giddy. And I remember jumping off one rock to the other, just like bold as they were, nothing major. But just feeling the excitement, the, the adrenaline, the endorphin, the rush of, of memories that came back to me from running all my childhood when I'd done the running to, to have that feeling was just incredible. And I can remember like screaming out in joy, just like, wow, this is incredible. And I stopped and I looked at the sunrise that was coming up and it's just a, a magical moment. And that was incredible. And I can remember turning around to think, right, I better, I better run home now or run back to the apartment that we'd, we'd rented out. And that's when the pain kicked in and it almost crippled me, it almost you know, buckled my leg. Cause I was just like, what the hell was that? And it was just, my ankle was just so hurting. And I thought, wow. And that was the consequence. Now I'm not going to the whole detail, but basically I, I started limping back and eventually once the adrenaline kicked in, I could run back. It wasn't quite as much fun running back. It was almost just like gritting my teeth and I've just got to get back. And when I got back to the apartment, I was shattered through pain, not through exercise. I was drained. And I was trying to remember how amazing it was at the beginning and I was smiling that, oh, it was awesome. But now it's really painful. And it's, it's like the, the yin and yang almost. And it's the, the, the pain and pleasure. Yeah. I had a load of pleasure and then I suffered with the pain. And the next day, what I realized was, you know, the next day I, I couldn't run. I struggled to walk with the amount of pain I was in. But the next day I swam instead. I could do that in the pools where the apartment were, were at. Uh, the next day I still couldn't run, but I hired a bike. And I went cycling again, thinking about what I could do rather than what I couldn't do. Now, by the third day, the pain had gone. So I ran again because I loved to run and I loved the feeling of it. And yeah, I got the pain. It had the consequences. But that that was my triathlon training, swimming, cycling and running day by day by day, thinking about what I could do rather than what I couldn't do. Getting this joy of running back to me was just incredible. There were consequences. And we moved now like you know, 10, 15 years on. There's still consequences. If, if I go for a run today, which I will do, I'll be limping at the end of it and I'll be limping tomorrow. But I love running. It's, it's right. my thing. It's what I love to do. And I'll do it while I can. There'll be the time in my life when I won't be able to do it anymore, I'm sure. Yeah. But I want to look back and say, no regrets. I did it while I could. Yeah, absolutely. So how did that, did that then lead on to actually going on to that kind of international stage? Oh, God, that's just like... So I did the first triathlon, amazing, swim, bike, run, meeting people, power triathletes from around the UK that weren't leaning on their excuses. You know, they, they had missing arms, missing legs, they were visually impaired. Some of them were completely blind and they're doing a triathlon. No excuses at all. Well, they've got excuses, but they're not leaning on them. I did the triathlon and in my category, I won. To cut a long story short. And, uh, but also that event was the British triathlon, uh, was the British championships. So when I crossed the line, I was announced British champion. This is amazing. So, yeah. but more than that, they said, Mr. Judge, you just won, you're British champion. Would you like to represent Great Britain? And I'm like, I would love to represent Great Britain. What do I have to do? And they said, well, you have to just say yes and we'll take it from there. And, and that opened a whole new field. The point is here, is that there's oppor is this an opportunity. There's opportunities everywhere. It's about seeing them, hearing them, smelling them. You yeah. just got to, and when you do, doing something about it, taking action, hold, getting hold of it with both hands and taking action, that's what I was prepared to do. Now, this was very challenging, difficult for me. I was working full time in health and safety in construction now. I had a family with two kids and now I wanted to do triathlon, swimming, cycling, running at an elite level. You know, my, my day, I started at 5.30, I'd go for a swim early morning, I'd go to work, 
I would work throughout the morning. At, at lunchtime, I'd go for a run, which is difficult. We didn't have any showers, and it was Sheffield, which was hilly. So I literally used a bucket and sponge to sponge myself down in the toilet cubicles, went back to my desk, uh, worked when I got home, played with the kids, put the kids to bed, and then I went out on my bike. I'm not saying I did that every day, but I'm thinking, what I'm saying is I thought about what I could do, what I couldn't do. How could I squeeze in this training as well as the family time, as well as the work? And that, then once I was doing that, I was setting new goals. I became British champion again in 2010, set my goals in the European Championships. I set my goals, uh, achieved British Championship again in the 2011, became European champion in 2011, and then that took me all the way out to the World Championships in Beijing. Again, meeting power triathletes from around the world this time, again, not leaning on their excuses, and we took part in that. The swim, the bike, the ride, amazing surroundings, the, the crowd cheering, wearing the GB kit, and it's nerve-wracking. You've, you've entered a whole new arena now, and I've stepped up to the mark, and I've done all my research, and yeah, and you're just waiting there, and you know, your heart's beating, and, and, and everybody's like, you're just waiting for that horn to go off, and that is the release, because that's the release of what, everything that you've built up. All this preparation, you've got no regrets. All the early mornings, the late nights, the hard work, whether it's the rehabilitation pain or whether it's the training pain, this all comes to it when that horn goes off. And this is such an exciting moment. But if you've done everything right, you, you, I was pretty much in the state of bring it on. I'm ready for this. I'm not nervous about it anymore. I'm ready for it. And the horn goes off. You do the swim. You come out to the swim and I was winning in my category. And then we're on to the bike section. We're running around, the, uh, cycling around the reservoir. And as we're going around, you know, you're, you're doing the brakes and the gears and people are overtaking you. You're, you're overtaking them back. And then you could come around to, to where the start was. The crowd is still cheering you on. You dump your bike. And then you're in the run section, 5K, you've got to run as fast as I could. Now, my running had improved at this stage, but I still knew the American, the French guy, they'd be chasing me down. So I'm running along, and I'd even practiced, practiced looking over my shoulder because I'd heard that some people fall over. When they look over the shoulder, they, they can fall over, and that could be disastrous. So I'd practiced that in my rehearsals, in, in my, my training. So I could look over my shoulder, it was fine, headstrong, round and round, 5K, coming around the final corner, hearing the crowd cheering, shouting my name. Not just go GB, but, you know, come on, Steve, come on, Judge. And, you know, smiling, but trying to smile too much and seeing that finish line, the, the finish line. And it seemed quite a long way off. It, it was like never ending, but that was it. That was the pinnacle. All the hard work that I put in was, was for that moment. And to cross that finish line, punch the air and try, becoming world champion was just such an incredible accolade for everything that I'd done. Over the, the nine years leading up to that moment, that was my reward. And not only that, standing on the podium, having my flag, my country's flag raised, my national anthem played for me and for my hard work, it's just incredible. It's just a very emotional time for me. But yeah, something that I, I'm so glad that I did. And I did that by hard work, action, benchmarking, goal setting. But yeah, mainly, you know, putting my heart and soul into it and achieving what I wanted to do. That's an amazing story, and I've, I've hairs on the back of my by neck are sticking up there. You know that kind of I'm there with you, really. You know, and you know, and and the imagination of you know your country's flag being hoisted, you know, the national anthem being played. Oh, you yeah. must be so proud of what you've achieved in that space of time. Absolutely amazing, Steve. Take my hat off to you. I genuinely do. Genuinely do. Great result. I mean, you, you go on in the book um, to talk about how, um, I don't know, is that race or, or the one that followed where you, you've got that kind of competition with the Italian athlete? Oh, yeah. The Italian. And, oh, my gosh. You know, that, that is just like, do you want to just discuss that? That is like nail biting, that is. Okay. So, the Italian. Um, so, I'm world champion, European championship the year after. I turn up there. I'm obviously the man to beat now. And this, this Italian's there. Well, I've not seen the Italian. Where's he come from? Well, I've not done any research on him. He looks pretty tall and fit and his gear looks good. So we do the European Championships. He beats me by four minutes. Four minutes is massive. Four minutes. You know, our race takes about one hour 15. So I couldn't even see him in front of me. Some people contested. They said, well, maybe he didn't do enough laps on the bike. And I'm thinking, no, I think he did. He's just really <laughs> fast. So I was, in, I was in no denial. I was just like, oh, my God. The thing is, is that my goal that year was very much, I wanted to be world champion again in New Zealand. That was my goal. That's what I was working towards every single day, going through that, uh, that, that mantra. When that happened, it, was, it hit me. It hit me hard. I suddenly realized that in six months' time, there's no way I could get four minutes quicker uh, in my swim, my bike, my run. 
because uh, I was I was like full pelt. I'd been the best that I could be. So I suddenly realised that my goal had to change. I couldn't go for gold medal. I'd have to go for silver medal or bronze medal. That would be my realistic goal, and that's what I would work towards. And then I realised what I was doing. I realised that I was leaning on my excuses, and so I needed to turn my excuses into challenges. And so that meant that I've got to go four minutes quicker in six months' time. I've, I've got to find out how to do that. So I've got to think how I can be more efficient on the swim, how I can get more power on the bike, how I can go faster in the run. I was thinking all of these things. As, you know, the thing is, when you're working towards your goal, your amazing goal, the thing that you really want, there's going to be times when you struggle, of course, there's highs and lows. But what I would say is don't ever change the goal, change the plan. And this is what I had to do. My goal was still to get the gold medal. I had to change the plan. How was I going to do that? Mixed in with that, I was realizing that some of my friends weren't even getting to the start line. I was gutted for them. They were, they were injured. I was like, you're joking me. I know how passionate they are about it. I learned from their mistakes. I suddenly realized that I had to put a lot more effort into my wellness, my, my upkeep. Um, you know, it's, wellness is very much about getting to the start line. If you can't even get to the start line, you can't even compete. If you can't get to work because you're ill, you're poorly, because you're burnt out, well, what use is that to you or anybody else? So I had to invest more time in my warming up, my warming down. I had to start doing more yoga, tai chi, mindset, meditation. No offense, but I found all of that quite boring. I wanted to, do, I wanted to be faster, stronger, more powerful. You know, I wanted to blitz it. That wouldn't cut it. I needed to get the balance right. And so I needed to take you know, responsibility of my body and my health. I'm, I'm happy to say that every race I entered, I, I you know, completed. I didn't get any injuries. And I'd say that's a real accolade to have, not only to be part of it, but to, to think about my body as well and my mindset. So I'm doing all of this. So in six months' time, we turn up at New Zealand, the Italian. He turns up as well. I'm like, oh, okay, let's bring that's it on. That's outrageous. How dare he? <laughs> I know, I know. You never know because you, you think he's going to turn up, but sometimes other people are injured and he right. wasn't injured. He was looking fit. I was like, okay, right, I'm ready for this. And I did my visualization and my visualization changed uh, dramatically before the race. I had always visualized uh, crossing the finish line and grabbing the gold medal. My visual uh, visualization has now changed to crossing the finish line, completely exhausted, burnt out, spent, just collapsed. I, I just wanted to give it all. I didn't care about the position anymore. I'd done all of that. Don't get me wrong, for six months, I've been thinking about gold medal. On the day is about being the best that I could be physically. So, and don't do anything wrong. Don't do anything wrong. Do the best that you can do. So, because <laughs> in triathlon, oh my goodness, anything can happen in triathlon. It's yeah. a very confusing sport. So, we get into the water. He is like a fish. He, 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 he swims in a, it's a Paralympian swimmer. So, the horn goes off. He, he flies off like a fish. I can't even see him. So, there's lots of punching and kicking that goes on. We get out of the swim. His bike's gone. I'm chasing on the bike. I can't even see him. We're cycling around the route. Uh, you're trying to look out for his outfit, but you're just holding on to dear life, to be honest. You come off the bike, I'm in second place, he's in first place in our category. And now we're on to the 5K run. Now this is where I can catch him. So I set off, I still can't see him, but my goal, my, my plan of action was to, if I can see him, uh, well, kind of eyes on the prize, we should say. If I can see him, I can catch him. If I can catch him, I can take him. I know that fact from all the research that I've done. Uh, so I just needed to see him. I couldn't see him. We're going round the route as well for 1K circuit five times. And eventually, after 2K, I can see him. So as I'm catching up to him, you know, he's pulling away from me. But I'm not thinking, there's like an anger inside me. I call it my, my white tiger, my cage tiger. Now, my cage tiger is very powerful and very fast. If I unleash it too early, I will burn out. So it's about containing my white tiger, containing it, taking it easy, doing the, the breathing, the pacing, and catching up to him slowly. As soon as I caught up to him, he's still pulling away from, him, from, from me. And I, I remember overtaking him. And then I was thinking, I need to get that distance. I need to stretch that elastic band between me and him so that it snaps, so that he doesn't think that he can get back on me. The only way I can do that is to unleash the tiger, the white tiger. So I literally open the cage and I, I push past him and then on beyond until he can't even see me. And then I'm burnt out. But the thing is, I then go back to my visualization. My visualization was cross the line, burnt out, keep going, keep going, don't ease up, Steve. And so I just keep going and I'm literally running on empty. I don't know how I'm going. And eventually I see the finish line, I think, thank goodness for that. And the crowd are going wild. I'm not even looking over my shoulder this time because it doesn't matter at this point. I see that finish line, the crowd are shouting my name and I cross the finish line. And on that day, I became the world champion for the second time running. Just amazing. Tears rolling down my cheeks from all the pain and anguish, all the heartache that I've been through that year from training, from personal problems I had with work and my marriage. 
everything built up to crossing that finish line. And I was very emotional for, for many, many reasons, but I did it and I was so proud of it. Oh, well done. Uh, I was chuffed when I kind of sort of read about that. It was just like, it was just gripping to, to, to be there and, uh, you know, sort of visualise that. And uh, um, I, I'm no triathlete myself, but where I used to live in Staffordshire, we used to have the um, Iron Man sort of come through our oh. village. Yeah. And I know that in that sport, there's a huge, great atmosphere. And obviously, I can remember one one Sunday afternoon sort of cheering everybody. And I was coming, come on, Steve. Come on, Julie. Come on, Jane. And I mean, this went on for about 40 minutes. And a lady in the village <laughs> came up to me. She goes, how the hell do you know all of these athletes? And I, and I stood there in my shape that I am. I said, well, I'm an athlete myself. I said, I, I know them. And I was carrying on. About half an hour later, she said, you're having me on, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. She goes, well, how do you know all of their names? I said, well, you look very carefully. It's got their names, hasn't it, on your, on your, on yep. your badges. Yep. The atmosphere within triathlon is just amazing, isn't it? I mean, yep. it is just an excruciating sport to do. You know, one you know, of those you know, sort of disciplines is amazing. But then to transition and do another and then another, I just, yep. you know, it's just amazing. Mm. I can only begin to imagine what it what it what it must be like, and I can't. <laughs> it's, I can't and it's imagine. not just, it's not just the physical side. I know that's very important. Yeah. But the tr I used to practice. So transition is um, when you come out of the water in your wetsuit. You're going to take your wetsuit off as quick as possible. Your goggles, your hat, and then you've got to get your number on, and you've got to get your cycling shoes on, helmet on, glasses on, and off on your bike. That is difficult. That is so when your heart beats more than 134 beats per minute, you can't think straight. Lots of mistakes are made. Um, because of that, when you're when you're running and you're looking at your watch, see what minute miles you're doing, you can't work it out because your brain's not working. So when you go into transition, you're trying to think, right, well, what do I need? Hat? No. T-shirt? What? Goggle? What? Shoes? And it's very confusing. Yeah. So you practice it. You practice it so you don't have to think about it. It becomes muscle memory. So the more you practice it, the better you get. So how do you practice transition? In my garden. So that's what I did. I used to put my wetsuit on in my garden. I used to run around. I used to put up my head on a pole and spin around until I got dizzy. That's what it's like when you come out to swim. And I'd be like falling around everywhere like a zombie. And then I'd run around the garden while I'm zipping my wetsuit, take it off, put the helmet on, uh, put my shoes on, do the number, grab my bike, stop the watch. Look at it. 24 seconds. Right. Let's do it again. And I'd do it again and again. I only did it about three times at a time because it is exhausting. But the point is when I did that, and I did that from the bike to the run as well, when I did a race, there's always a discussion about not only the swim, the bike, and the run, but how was your transition? How was your transition? Oh, I found it quite difficult. Oh, I, did you find? And people say, Steve, how was your tra transition? And I'd say, I can't remember because it was a blur and I know it was perfect. I did nothing wrong because I practiced it, not only in my garden, but I'd also get there early. Yeah. And I'd practice running in and running out. I'd do everything. Uh, and, and that's how I did everything. That's how I do stuff. It's how you do anything, it's how you do everything. And so trans a triathlon is a great learning curve for, you know, think about what you can do rather than what you can't do. If, you, if you're injured in one sport, like running, then you just go swimming for a bit. If you're injured in swimming, you do cycling for a bit. But it's also about getting everything laid out. And this, is, this goes to default diary as well. You know, if there's something that you need to do, get it laid out. Get it laid out the night before, like a transition, so that it's dead easy to do. So you just literally go to, you know, the transition, you just put your hat on, you put your goggles, your, your shoes on, and off you go. In work situation, Sometimes I lay out on my desk what I need to do the next day. So when I get to work, I'm like, huh, I guess I'm doing my accounts today then. Not that I don't want to do my accounts, but, you know, I've got to do it. It's all laid out. You make it so easy. Uh, to the point of cycling in the winter, very difficult. It's dark. It's cold. Yeah. I knew that when I woke up, I wouldn't want to cycle. Fact. So what I used to do was not all the time, but I used to sometimes wear my cycling gear to bed. So when I woke up, I was in my cycling gear and it's actually more effort to take it off yeah. and not go cycling than to just grab my bike, my helmet, my sandwiches that I'd made and go for a cycle ride. You've got to make things easy. You've got to practice them, especially the things that could be difficult. Practice them. Is it like negative meditation? You do a meditation of all the things that give you fear and then you sort those things out. What am I scared of? Transition, sort it out. What am I scared of? Accounts, let's get that sorted. Eat that frog, all of those things. Yeah. Think about it and then do it. Take action. It is the action. Don't just dwell on it. So tri triathlon is that massively. It's not just being physical fit. People have been disqualified just put by not putting their helmet in a box, by leaving their wetsuit hanging out. Because it's a trip hazard. You can get disqualified. So you practice. I used to practice throwing my helmet you know, into the box. And I used to say it out loud, helmet in box. 
because otherwise you can get disqualified. All that training, all that effort, all that traveling, and because you don't put your helmet in a box, you get disqualified. How crazy is that? So don't do it. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, it's a, there's a lot to do with triathlon. It's interesting that you talk about action a lot, and I have this little phrase that's saying, thinking can become negative, whereas action is always positive. It mm. all moves you, you know, just get one foot in front of the other, move one step closer. And, you know, I think that, you know, one of, one of the things I'm passionate about is that, you know, most people live their lives by accident rather than design. And that's, that's kind of something I want to kind of, you know, lead on to now. Because obviously, you know, you, you've come through that trauma. You've then become, you know, the top dog at your, your, your sport, not once, but twice. And, you know, uh, and, and, and everything that goes along with that. Now, so how have you transitioned, using that word, how, how have you transitioned from that now, being, you know, top of your game athlete, to being what you do now? So tell us about what you do now so that everyone understands who you are, what you do now. Okay. So now I'm an international motivational speaker. Uh, I also do workshops where I, so as a motivational speaker, I inspire and I motivate. But my, my goal, my why is to help inspire and motivate. How do I help people? So that's why I do my workshops about uh, presentation skills, goal setting, wave of resilience. That's when I can actually give homework and actually help people. Uh, that's lovely. And I also do coaching as well. So I do one-to-one -one coaching. Uh, also an author, obviously, as I've written my autobiography, uh, which you, you have there. Here we go. Okay, it excellent. Post-it um, notes in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, isn't that strange? You put post-it notes in and I put post-it notes in as well. <laughs> your post-it notes there. Um, so yes, that's what I do now and I absolutely love it. So how did I get to that stage? So when I finished my, when I retired from international competition, I was still working in the construction industry. Um, I got another job working in the media team for the Scout Association, so an actual paid job. But after three years, that contract finished. Now, right. during that time, I'd been doing a few talks for schools and charities, and I loved it. It was really good, giving something back. And so when my contract finished after three years, they said, Steve, you know what, well, what are you going to do now? Are you going to get a new job, or what job are you going to get? And I said, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. And it's like I stood there with like a, my hands on my hips, like a Superman pose, and looking into the sky. I said, I... I'm going to be a motivational speaker. And they were like, wow, Steve, that's awesome. How are you going to do that? And I was still stuck in the pose. And I said, I haven't got a clue. Because I didn't, have, I didn't have a clue how I was going to be a motivational speaker. Just to earn enough money through that, to earn a living, to have that as a business, rather than just a hobby or something nice to do. How do I do that? But I'd learned already by that stage that I, if I wanted something enough, if I was passionate about it, if that was my goal, then I could work towards it. I would make it happen. Whether it's growing my leg back, whether it's becoming a world champion twice. If I wanted to run a business as a motivational speaker, there's other people doing it. So I need to find out what they're doing and do what they're doing. So um, I, I joined the PSA, Professional Speaking Association. Uh, and I went there for it's a monthly meeting. And when I got there, they said, Steve, it'd be great to you, for you to be here. Um, if you want to join as a member, I'll tell you what, if you join as a member, you can even enter the competition. I went, oh, competition, you said. I am a little bit competitive. <laughs> they said it's, a, it's, it's called speaker factor and you speak for five minutes, no slides. Um, and we, we judge you on your, your voice, your stagecraft, your message, your bookability. And if you, if you get through the Yorkshire heats, you get to the final and then you'll be in front of 300 of the top speakers of the UK in your first year. Uh, is that something that you want? And I said, that sounds an absolute nightmare. Count me in. <laughs> because I'd also, learn, I'd also learned that to achieve your goals, you've got to go out of your comfort zone. Of course you have. It's not going to be easy. It's not an easy journey. You've got to grab those opportunities, these challenges. And so I entered. And lo and behold, at the end of the year, I got to that final stage. I was in front of 300 of the top UK speakers. There was only five of us there. I didn't win the whole thing. My goal was to get to that stage. Okay, I'd learned that through New Zealand and, and the, the time after that was to have that goal in mind to win. But as long as I was the best that I could be, the result was the result. And my goal was to get to that stage so that people could see me. Uh, people still talk about me being on that stage and they still think that I won. Uh, it was a very close, close thing. But I think what I've done is I've taken it from there because after I got off that stage, you know, coming second place, I was buzzing. I was like, I want this. I, I love this so much. And that was four, four years ago. And now at the moment, I'm now the president of the Professional Speaking Association in Yorkshire. And now I'm helping new speakers come in, go into that competition. It's, it's on 20th of June in Yorkshire. And I'm telling them, you know, this, is, this could be your start. If you want to get to that, that main stage, if you want to be a speaker like me, 
then this is what you need to do. And they're like, well, I'm not too sure if I should enter. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is an opportunity. Yeah, it's five yeah. minutes. You could end up on the main stage. This could be the start. Yeah. And yes, the, 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 what puts them off is they're nervous. They, they don't want to be judged. It's very hard to take feedback on, but that's what I'm doing. So yes, helping, inspiring and motivating and, and grabbing those opportunities. My, my vision is to, to stand, to, to inspire and motivate as many people as possible. The bigger the stage, the better. I can do 10 people. Of course I can, or 20, but why not 200? Why not 2,000? Mm. Why not 200,000? I know with this online community that we've got now, I can do even more. And that's grabbing opportunities as well. However, you can't beat being on a stage with real people in front of you. Mm. You know, I've spent the last three months because of the, the coronavirus just staring into the camera lens. And it's not the same feedback as seeing people's faces with the shock and the horror and the clapping. A virtual clap is not the same as a real live standing ovation. Mm. I will take it while I can. But don't get me wrong, I can't wait to get back on the stage in the big conference where I can see people's faces, their delight, and their, their absorption of, of the messages that I've got, of the story, but the, the, the memorability. I think that's the thing. I'm always thinking about how I can make my story more memorable because the more memorable it is, then they're going to remember the messages and that's going to help them for longer. Even online, I'm doing sound effects now so that people can remember you know, my story. So when I tell my story, I have the the sound of the car crashing, I had the sound of the ambulance turning up, I had the sound of the rain falling down, I had the sound of the crowds cheering me on, and I've got actual footage of that, the crowd shouting, Steve, go GB, waving and cheering, it's amazing. This is not me saying, that other people have said it's an amazing experience as I tell my story with my excitement and my actions, I do the swimming action, the cycling action, but also the sound effects. It's like people are actually there living it with me. So. I'm doing that online. Maybe I'll take that onto the stage as well. But I always say that my, my presentation is so much more of a performance than anything else. And I love it. You're very gifted at it as well. I mean, I think it's really cool to have those audio anchors, which is essentially what you've got going on there. And, uh, you know, it brings it to life. Um, I mean, I've seen a couple of video clips of you um, competing and uh, you can't help but get swept along away with it. I even saw one of you when, you, when you're trying to learn to walk again with your crutches and you fall down and you're yeah. angry. Um, and I know, I know the story. I know that you're okay now and all the rest of it, but I couldn't help be emotionally engaged with that because you're thinking... Crack, I want to help that guy. You know, I want to go and help him up on his feet. I want to do that, you know. And I think that's the, the great thing about your story, Steve, is it's just so authentic. It's yeah. so real. You know, I've seen a number of uh, motivational speakers. And um, I think sometimes there is a disconnect with who they are on stage versus who they are in real life. There's a lack of congruency, shall we say. And I'm not yeah. saying that, that, that that's for everyone because I'm, you know, I'm convinced it isn't. Uh, I've seen some great people. Uh, some of them I know in real life as well. And they're, they're a bit like me. You know, what you see is what you get, you know, both on the screen here and in real life. That's kind of, you know, who I really am. And I think it's that authenticity. But, you know, going through your book, um, there's some absolute little gems in here. I love the fact that you talk about don't compare yourself to other people. And I know that l last week when you and I spoke, you know, I talked about a time in my life where, you know, we worked with um, an organization and they had these huge, big, scary goals out here. And that was that was the idea, have this huge, big, scary goal. And, and for me, it didn't work. And I've shared this with, you know, clients of ours over the years because, Every year, it just always reminded me of all the stuff that I hadn't done, you know, and it actually became a negative thing. Yeah. And I thought, you know, and I went through about three years of this. And I'm thinking, why am I feeling like a failure, even though I'm making progress here? Um, and actually, sometimes you've got to tune into your own mind and find out what works for you. And one of my colleagues, he, he released a book and published it in the United States. Uh, and he went off like wildfire over there. But in, in, in his book, um, a guy called Derek Mills, by the way, if you're, if you're interested, um, is, is this analogy that he uses about having uh, daily standards, you know, having strong, you know, and demanding daily standards, because you can control that. You can control today and only for today. What are the things that you can do that make you one step closer to where you need to be? This big, scary goal out here, it's too big to get your head around it at this beginning of the journey. But if you start making little baby steps along the way, um, and the other little thing I wrote down here on my screen is we, we, have all, we all have time, but it's how we cultivate it. Mm. I think that's a great analogy that you've got there. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. I mean, I've got a few questions here. So, I mean, if you could speak to your 18-year-old self again now, what one thing would you want to make sure you told him? Um, 
uh, probably want to uh, avoid driving on that day when I had the car crash. Um, <laughs> if, if I couldn't do that, um, I would say, oh, that's, that's a good question. I think I would say keep believing in yourself. Keep believing um, in yourself. Because I think we, we all struggle at times about belief in ourselves. I'm very confident, I'm very optimistic, but there's times where I still struggle about believing in myself. And when I do, amazing things happen. So it, it's having that mindset to have that belief and then going forward and taking action. We just talk about take action, take action. Believing in yourself to take action is really important. Otherwise, you just won't do it. It's, it's all about, you can get so many tools from people, uh, but how do, you st how do you stay motivated all the time? Whether it's about you know, having a vision or doing the benchmarking or even taking action, how do you stay motivated? And I think the main thing is to believe in yourself. And that does come in very much in with, you know, don't compare yourself to other people. Because if you start doing that, everybody's different and you, you, there's, there, there will be some negative uh, out there. So, so don't do it. So believe in yourself, keep going, doing what you're doing uh, and, and be the best that you can be. So you talked about, we can only control what we do in one day. Yeah. I have that, you know, at the end of every day, as my head hits the pillow, I ask myself, Steve, any regrets today? Did you do everything you were supposed to do or did you not? And, I, and sometimes I go, uh, no, I didn't do everything I wanted to do. I had five things that I wanted to do that would take me towards my goal. I needed three of them. I've got to carry two over. And there might be other times when, you know, I say, well, I didn't do the, the two other things because I was spending time with my kids. And I go, any regrets? And I go, no, 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 actually no regrets. That's a good thing. And so sometimes things change, but only you can answer whether you've got regrets or not. And it is an absolutely lovely feeling when you close your eyes going, no regrets, it's been a good day. I've done all that stuff. I've even done stuff with my family and my partner and my work and my business. I even did some fitness stuff, even ate healthily. It was great. So it's a really no regrets day. And, and to have that every day would be my goal, to have the no regrets. And I don't. And that's not a bad thing. It just means that I'm talking to myself and say that's okay we'll just pass it on to the next day but just don't don't drop it too much so believing in myself and being the best that i can be every single day having no regrets having no regrets for for life really uh, is, is what i want and i know you mentioned it in in your book isn't it there's there's a there's a poem in the first couple of pages about the guy on his deathbed and i read the poem and uh, gladly a lot of those lines i was like that's not me, that's not me, that, oh, that is me, okay. And that's the, but a lot of it, I am having the no regrets, and that's good that I've got that at this stage, at this early stage of my life, uh, I've still got a long way to go, and there's still, there's still changes that I want to make. Yeah, well, life, you know, it's a journey, isn't it? You know, it's, yeah. you, no matter where you get to, there's always, you know, the next stage of where you need to be, so uh, it's, um, you know, it's forever. I mean, you'd like to give out quotes of the day on your social media, I noticed. I watched one this morning. Um, so if you could choose, you know, only one to live by, what, 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 what would that be? Uh, just one? Are you just kidding one. me? <laughs> what, 100? Happy, okay, number one. <laughs> um, so uh, after I've done my quote of the day, seven o'clock every morning, I then, and I get these quotes from the internet or from people send them in. So people can send them in, I use them. And what I do is I don't just say it, I then split it down and say that how, how that makes me feel, how I incorporate that with my life whether that's a uh, leg amputation type thing or, or elite athlete or business or coronavirus or whatever, or even you know, what I did yesterday, I break it down and people like that. And, and it's very authentic because it's absolutely not planned. So I have to be authentic. If you're not authentic, you'll get caught out. You'll, you'll say something wrong and you'll, you'll mess yeah. up. It's, it's from the heart and that's the best way. Now, after I finish my quote of the day, I'm on the rowing machine. I then go to, to my kitchen and I have a wall a white wall and I write every quote on the wall so that wall has got about 100 quotes uh, I use a sharpie and I'm not very good at spelling so it's a very scary situation but I, I write my quotes on so I've got about 100 quotes on my wall but what's interesting is that they all seem to circulate around one quote and the quote is in the middle and I don't know if I did that subconsciously or consciously uh, the quote in the middle is is no regrets right. that is the main thing uh, which is you know, we just talked about that. I was only to go through that again, but no regrets is what I live, to live for. But I think my favorite one uh, after that would be um, don't lean on your excuses, turn your excuses into challenges because there are excuses out there. Of course there are. I'm not saying that there's not, 
especially in winter. There's absolutely loads. It's dark, it's cold, it's miserable. There's loads of excuses. What I'm saying is don't lean on them. Okay, admit that they're there. And if it's a fact, fair enough, it's a fact. If it's an excuse, admit that it's an excuse. Don't lean on it. Put something in place so you can smash through it and turn it into a challenge. If you're competitive, great. If you're not competitive, find something that will make you challenge and smash through that, that barrier, that excuse, so that you can get to your goal. And then we expand on to, well, what is your goal and why are you working towards that? But the main thing, the main uh, quote that I would use to get to the no regrets is the, be, uh, is the don't lean on your excuses. So that would be my favorite one that I'd say. That's brilliant. Uh, it ties in very much in terms of what we do as well, because you know, we kind of have questions uh, as a trained coach. I kind of go through things with people. So if you had all the money in the world, what would you do? And people give you this kind of shopping list of all the stuff that they would want to be, have or do in their lives, which is, which is great. But then I, I, I change the frame of reference that people like look through, the kind of lens, if you like, that look through and say, well, imagine that yesterday you saw a medical practitioner and, you know, this is exactly like, you know, your accident, but it's like you saw a medical practitioner and you got some good news and you got some bad news. So, you know, the good news is, um, you know, you're never going to you know, experience any pain or discomfort, but you, the bad news is you do know that in five years time, that's it, lights out. So knowing that, what would you do differently with your life now? And it's amazing the different sets of answers that you get from people. And then we finish off by saying, you know, if you died yesterday, what's your one biggest regret in life? And I'm not asking these questions to be morbid or anything, but it just makes people stop, yeah. think, and then plan about what they want to do sort of for their lives going forward. Because like I said earlier, most people aim at nothing and hit it with tremendous accuracy. So... I'm just curious, and I've written down here, biggest goal. So what, what's your biggest goal that you've got, you know, in, in, your, in your own mind's eye at this moment in time? What's the one thing you'd absolutely love to kind of be, have, or do? Okay, so this is where it gets quite scary because you're, 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 you're giving out your, your deepest thoughts and dreams in a way. I've always got a few on the go. Um, I think coronavirus is very much survival. You know, I'm a conference speaker, so you can understand there's not many conferences. So survival comes into it there, <laughs> and that's about taking things online. So I was talking to, to my mastermind group about um, uh, going online, taking my workshops online. Uh, I'm, I'm looking towards that passive income, uh, financial freedom. Sure. How do I do that as a speaker who talks about me, myself? I am my business. So how can I do that? Uh, an agency of speakers would be one thing. I'd love that. Um, online content that people can download constantly uh, when I'm sleeping, perfect, that's what I'm working towards. But no such thing as coincidences, but it's interesting when you get certain pieces of jigsaws that fit together and you're just like, wow, this is incredible, and they, they, they create this picture. So I connected with two people recently, one of them, uh, both inspirational guys, I won't go into great depth with them, but uh, one guy has done some acting, he's now produced his own film, and he's starring in it. That's one guy. Another guy has been through a massive story, adversity, and he's uh, doing a film about himself and about his story. Uh, tie that in with a film that I saw the other day on Netflix, and the guy has a, a really bad accident and has a, a metal cage around his leg, and then he gets into competitive sport again, and he achieves. And I just thought, right, I've said this a lot of times, and it's in my book on the last page, I want to film about me, my story. I want to see how far that goes. That's my big thing at the moment. I'm not ignorant. I know that this, this can take lots of money and lots of time, but I need to start it going. So time with that, someone has asked me to write a chapter for them for their global book about my story in one chapter. My story, one chapter. It took me a whole book to write my story. So how do I squeeze my story down to one chapter? That's a challenge. Huh, that'd be fun. Uh, but once I've got that chapter that tells my whole story with my with my messages, with my quotes, with the highs and the lows, that's almost a script and that would be very exciting. So I've already made, made uh, movements on that, that my keynote, which was half an hour, I've just had it transcribed. Uh, so I've now got all of that written up for me. It's too long at the moment, it's 6,000 words, I need to get it down to 3,000. That's what I'll work on. Once I've got that, then I'm gonna submit that and then, I can, then I've got that if I meet a producer, if I meet somebody who makes films, if I want to go and look for them, if I want to go make content, uh, contact. Also, I wouldn't mind doing a trailer, a film trailer of this film that doesn't exist, of course, at the moment. But how much would that cost? I don't know. But that's what I, that's in the back of my head. So I'm not working on that necessarily every single day because I've got the survival thing that I talked about. Yeah. But my big, massive goal that's out there, maybe yeah. unrealistic, maybe not reachable, 
is to have a, a film made of Steve Judge's story. There you go. That would be brilliant. That would be brilliant. Mm -hmm. I think it's great that you've got that as the idea out there. So anybody watching this video today and you can help Steve in that regard, then, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, please do yeah. reach out and make, uh, make contact with us. And uh, we'll see how it works, is. isn't it? Yeah. Is there anything else you think we should be covering at all, Steve? Um, no, I haven't talked much about the wave of resilience, which is something I've come up with the coronavirus, uh, you know, lockdown. A lot of people say, oh, it's a good time to think about things. The main thing that I came up with was there's these things of, of uh, the, the curve of the grief curve, I think it is. Um, I've created the thing called the wave of resilience, which is very much, and we, we won't go into great depth, maybe we'll have to cover it some other time, but the wave of resilience is really nice for me because it helps me and also other people visualize what's going on when they do hit hard times. And I talk about, I don't talk about grief so much or change so much. My story is very much adversity. And the adversity, that, that's how the wave starts. And you hit adversity and then you have a shock. You have a denial. And this is my story. You know, I was in hospital. I had the shock and the denial. This isn't happening to me. Then I had the anger. The anger that brought me down the curve, down, the, down to hit rock bottom, pretty much. And when I was at rock bottom, when anybody's at rock bottom after their adversity, they were there for a long time. Well, they're there for a certain amount of time. But they can decide how long they're at rock bottom for. Right. A long time or short time. And I know every situation is different but there's certain tools that you can use to bring yourself out of that rock bottom. And those are the tools that I share in my workshops because I want to help people. And it might be the music, it might be the, the writing things down, it might be the drawing pictures. There's lots of tools that I use and still do because I'm still having low periods now. My adversity is not so, so high as it was, but it's still there. But now I know what comes after the rock bottom and that is acceptance. Once you take the acceptance and you know where you're going, you then take the action. And now you're moving forward. Now you're moving upwards. And then you're moving towards self-actualization. And this is exactly what I was talking to, to, to everybody about on my social media this morning was that the Maslow theory yeah. about the pinnacle of the, the pyramid that, that people quote now is the self-actualization. That ties into my wave of resilience. And the, the beauty about this, and I'll go into this in great depth because I've, I've been making something as an engineer, a physical thing. The self-actualization ends up being higher than where you were at the beginning. So um, as much as adversity is horrible and the shock and denial and the anger, if you do it right and you grab those opportunities and you, you have that bounce ability, you build up your resilience through, through training and practice, you will end up higher than you were before. And that's what you need. That's what you need to, to survive. That's what you need to, to get there. Otherwise, you will be, life is okay. Life is all right. Life is like a, a flat line, okay? And at the end of that flat line, you will have regrets. If you get self-actualization, wave after wave, and if you haven't got adversity, then you're not pushing yourself hard enough. You've <laughs> got to push yourself out, in, out of your comfort zone into that, 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 that space where you get the shock and denial yourself. You create it yourself. You come to the bottom, but you learn from it, and you bring yourself up again to the self-actualization. You do a couple of those waves, you get higher and higher and higher. And by the end of your life, you will be so high that you will be there. And that is what I'm doing. Whether that's rehabilitation, elite athletes, becoming an author, speaking on the stage, I'm getting higher and higher. And my life, when somebody says to me, how's life? I go, it's brilliant. It's awesome. It's fantastic. How's yours? Yeah, it's all right. How's work? That's yeah, okay. How's your love life? Yeah, it's all right. You know, it seems such a waste. You know, wouldn't it be good if you could say that things are absolutely amazing? So what does it take to get you there? Again, what is your goal? What is your why? Are you using the wave of resilience to get there? So I'd love to talk to you in more depth some other time about that. But yeah, it all ties in together. That'd be really cool, Steve, actually, because I think that's something that's really important right now. There are a lot of people out there who are struggling. I mean, I have a mastermind group that I'm part of, and I guess, you know, the guys around that table, we're all wired in a particular way. So most of us are kind of sort of, you know, out of adversity comes opportunities is, is our kind of mindset. But, you know, I'm aware that there are a lot of people out there who haven't, you know, had the exposure that I've had in my career, you know, with, with great thinkers and, and people around me to help and support. And a lot of people have been in, you know, they've got different backgrounds and, you know, there's a lot of fear out there at the moment, particularly with, you know, COVID and everything that goes with that. And as we start, you know, as the government start releasing the brakes, and I'm not being political here, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, we each have to find a way to cope with this. And I appreciate yeah. it's going to be different ways for different people because we're all wired differently. But any tips and techniques or strategies that people can use to help yeah. them along that journey, then I'd love to kind of pick up on that theme, you know, with you uh, at a later date, maybe. 
Yeah, no, and absolutely. And again, that ties into my help, inspire, and motivate. I can inspire and motivate every yeah. morning at seven o'clock. How do I help them? What information, what tools can I give that people actually take away and help? That's what I really want to do. And it's about finding the right forum. And speaking to you here in the, on the Coffee with Carl is a brilliant forum for me to, to share that. And then I'm looking for more opportunities all the time. So again, to the listeners, whether it's about making a film about me or more opportunities that I can share, that's what I'm up for. It's about grabbing those opportunities and doing something about them. Steve, it's been brilliant talking to you this morning. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, I've still got questions here I could have asked you, but I'm just mindful <laughs> of the time. So thanks very much for spending the time with us today. Do genuinely appreciate that. And if people want to connect with you, how is it best that they do that? Oh, okay. So I'm on social media everywhere. Um, so Facebook, just type in Steve Judge. Facebook, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a really good business one like that. Twitter, Instagram. Instagram, I'm, I'm Scout Judge, not Steve Judge. But you type in Steve Judge, you'll find me. So yeah, follow me. Follow me on all of those. Don't follow me home. That's, that's stalking. Don't stalk me. <laughs> just follow me on social media. But also um, Google me. Uh, I think you can find me that way. Um, I've got a website as well. And so if you want to go into that, that's www.steve dash judge.co.uk dead easy to find in fact don't lean on your excuses if you want to find me contact me just do it just just google it if we find me fine how do people get a copy of your book if they want to pick up on this so yes my book my book is available on amazon um but also if you want a signed copy or anything just contact me and i can put a nice personal message in it send it to you and we can sort out the payment and everything uh, but it's also available on my website. So there's various ways to get that. It is a good book. I know I say that, but a lot of people are saying it as well. It, because it, it's, split, it's split up with pictures. It's got poetry. It's got music, music. It's got lots of things that splits the book out. It's not just a one end to the other. It is an autobiography, so it tells a story. Yeah. But it, it's definitely, definitely life-changing. And so I encourage anybody to, to grab it and, uh, yeah, enjoy it's it. It's good read. It's good read. I, I, I haven't read it all yet because it's, it's, a, it's a thoroughly... Um, comprehensive <laughs> book, so there's a lot here to go through but i love the photographs in the air it kind of brings it to life uh, yeah. it, it did make me smile a number of times because the, the chapter uh contents at the beginning it's almost like desert island discs you've got yeah. like different sort of pieces of music that have kind of uh inspired you along the way and uh that, that's really cool so and, and thanks the, sorry go on the, the, the music you're talking about authenticity now being authentic is about telling people what music you like there is a mixture i admit don't don't judge me too much on the music. You know, you've got ACDC mixed in with Chesney Hawks, okay? Yeah. That's my music. Yeah. Don't compare yourself to others. There's, there's so many messages about the music, which I won't go into, but those, those tunes help me. I think music is a massive, powerful influence that people should use, maybe not used enough. I've recently signed up with Spotify because uh, I need music more in my life, especially through these challenging times. So uh, yeah, grab my book, find out what tunes I'm talking about and see whether you agree or not. Maybe message me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Great to talk to you today. Cheers, mate. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Bye-bye.